Welcome to the Positive Gene Podcast. My name is Sarah Cavanaugh. This is a podcast empowering cancer previvors and survivors over our hereditary cancer risk. I started this podcast because I had so many questions after receiving my genetic testing results and not only wanted, but needed to truly understand what it meant to have an inherited cancer mutation. We will discuss important topics from a patient perspective, like finding credible online resources, opportunities connecting with others for support, and building your medical team, and so much more. We're all in this together, and I'm so thankful for your support. Let's dive in. So welcome to the Positive Gene Podcast, where we delve into the empowering world of navigating hereditary health challenges with grace and strength. I'm your host, Sarah Kavanaugh, and today I am thrilled to introduce a special guest, friend, and yoga teacher, Marina, Marina Mukandala. Marina is the president and CEO of Life, Living Inspired, Fit, and Empowered. We love that empowerment part right there. (laughs) Fits well with our show. Marina is an accomplished yoga teacher and entrepreneur who brings a wealth of experience to yoga, mindfulness, and personal empowerment. Her journey includes extensive training with Baron Baptiste and the creation of transformative yoga programs. Marina's work is all about empowering the mind, body, and spirit. So you are truly inspiring, Marina. I really appreciate you being here. You have such grace and beauty and everything that you do and your whole presence just lights up the room every time I see you. And I think I'm probably not alone when I say that anybody who leaves one of your classes always feels restored, reinvigorated, and just truly blessed. You always end our classes with some kind of inspirational message or quote or a message from the Bible, right? Somewhere where we just get some beauty kind of overflowing over us. So I always appreciate everything that you do for us. And I wanted to bring that energy right to the podcast um, because you're just amazing. So welcome to the show. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) You're welcome. So let's talk a little bit about what inspired you to establish life or L-I-F-E and and how yoga became sort of a cornerstone of your life. So you can kind of give us a little bit of background on, on your journey. Yes, absolutely. I started yoga at the age of 24. I was riddled with anxiety during that particular time in my life. I was fairly newly graduated from college from my undergraduate studies and entering the real world, quote unquote, and really in this place and space where I was trying to figure out where I belonged. What is it that I'm supposed to do with my life? And I've always been overachiever. I've always been a type A perfectionist type of person. And it really came to a head in my early 20s. So at 24, I developed panic attacks. And a good friend of mine at the time encouraged me to join her for a yoga class. She said, Marina, I really think that this is going to help you. And I says, well, tell me more about this yoga class. And she says, well, it's 90 minutes and it's in a room that's heated to 105 degrees with 50% humidity. And I'm thinking who voluntarily would put themselves in this environment for 90 minutes? She said, I'll tell you what, come to class with me one time. If you don't like it, you never have to come back again. But what do you have to lose by trying? So I said, well, all right. I remember I was there one Sunday afternoon for a 4 p.m. class. I was in the back of the room, twisting and contorting myself in ways I didn't know I could twist and contort, sweating in places I didn't know I could sweat. It was the hardest 90 minutes, yet it was the most glorious 90 minutes. I remember the ride home. I just felt at peace, at ease. For the first time, I wasn't up in my head. I wasn't consumed with thoughts. And I said to myself, there's got to be something to this yoga thing. And I was hooked. I kept coming back to class, back to class, back to class, back to class. And about six months into my practice, 
I felt so clearly the Holy Spirit telling me one day in Shavasana, final resting pose, relaxation, this is what I've called you to do. This is what you're to do. This is the plan. You are to impact as many lives as possible through this practice and help people to heal mind, body, and spirit. So I said, oh, all right, God, I don't know how that's going to all work. (laughs) So fast forward to 2012. I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. I opened up a yoga studio in 2012. I ran that successfully for eight and a half years until August of 2020, where we sadly succumbed to the pandemic and went out of business. And after that happened, of course, I mean, I was absolutely devastated, but I knew deep in my heart that God wasn't finished with me or my work for that matter. I'm still alive. I'm still breathing. So I still have purpose. And I prayed over it. I meditated over it for what's next. What am I to do next? And from that prayer and meditation day in and day out, Life with Marina was born. I had the vision of bringing forward just all the things that I loved about my brick and mortar space and taking it outward into the world in a bigger, grander capacity because now I'm not confined to the four walls. I can impact many people. So the vision behind Life with Marina Yoga is all about just... Um, touching as many environments, people, places, spaces as I can. So uh, the corporate client, the individual client, children, teens, tweens, um, I mean, you name it, virtual classes, in-person classes, conferences, workshops, co-leading teacher trainings. So essentially, again, everything I loved in my space now taken out of the four walls and brought to many different arenas. That's awesome. You talked through how before yoga, you had some anxiety and a little bit of a struggle there. And that yoga was a catalyst for this sort of newfound way of managing your anxiety and stress, right? So take us through how yoga contributes to mental and physical well-being. And as our podcast, we're particularly talking about people who are facing significant health challenges, like either they are already have been identified with a hereditary cancer risk, so they have the weight, um, such as myself, right, the weight of that that we carry, uh, maybe we might follow that with a, a surgery, some kind of preventative surgery, or we also have survivors and thrivers that are on, you know, listening to the podcast as well. So take us through in your experience, that mental and physical well-being, you know, take us through how yoga can help us with that. Absolutely. I think the power, well, there's, there's a lot of power in yoga, but I think one of the key components is that it forces you to slow down. <laughs> Um, when you step foot on your yoga mat and you're in a class, not only are you slowing everything down, right? You're literally stepping from away from the external world and you're coming into a space where it's just you, your yoga mat, right? And others in the form of a community. And so it, it, it forces you to slow down in the sense that you're coming away from everything external, all the responsibilities, and it shines a light on what's going on in your thoughts, what's going on in your emotions, what's even going on in your physical body. And so through self-awareness, you are then able to identify you know, what, what are my triggers? What are my fears? What is keeping me trapped in the space of fear, keeping me trapped in the space of living into the unknown? And then from that, you can work through it. For me, what showed up with anxiety in particular was a need to control, a need to control and a need to always know what's what's coming. And so through the asanas, through the classes, through not really knowing what was ever going to come up next, right? I realized, wow, I can be in the space of not having control and still be okay. 
So I'd say that the practice gives us the tools that help us to realize, okay, there could be that possibility. There could be that chance, that risk. There could be the unexpected phone call that comes, you know, in the middle of the night. There could be all those things. And in the midst of those, I still have the tools, breath, meditation, prayer, community, to navigate what it is I'm going through. Mm -hmm. It's just hearing you say it in the sense of breath, prayer, meditation, community. People may not think of yoga, you know, if they're not experienced with the yoga community, it is more than just showing up on the mat to stretch, right? Yes, absolutely. Right? And that kind of ties into the the question of the mind-body connection. You're speaking to yoga helping us manage our way through these fears. And it, there are elements of yoga that teach you forms of meditation and gives you that toolkit, like you said. If somebody looks to this as a practice or is an interested in kind of taking that leap, how do you believe that yoga strengthens that mind-body connection to help us manage that stress? And, and I'll follow that up with maybe another question related to some, some practical techniques. But what is that? What is, how does yoga strengthen the mind-body connection to manage us through that stress and anxiety? Yeah, great question. So when you get on your yoga mat, like I say, you're stepping away from sort of everything external. So then what does that leave you with? It leaves you with yourself, right? You, you, you meet yourself. You can't hide from yourself or run from yourself in a yoga class. You're there. One of my favorite sayings is where you go, there you are. So when you come into a yoga studio and you're on your mat, there you are. So you immediately notice the thoughts. I mean, they will come up very quick in certain poses as well. You know, plank pose. If I'm holding the top of a push-up, for example, for five to 10 deep breaths, my mind is going to start to go, right? So there's, again, that self-awareness piece. Where's my mind? Where are my thoughts? And then by acknowledging where the mind is, it then allows you to drop into physicalness, right? The physical body. Okay, my mind is saying I have to run from this plank. My body, though, reminds me that I'm actually okay in this plank. My hands are on the floor. My feet are on the ground. There's options, right, in a yoga class just as there is in life. I could lower my knees. I can take a child's pose and rest. So there's the mind, right? We notice the thoughts. We notice what's there. And then there's that bodily connection because the body has a response too, right? Our parasynthetic nervous system kicks in. It's like that flight or fight. The moment the mind says, I can't hold this plank. And then you come back into, well, wait a minute. I'm actually okay. And you realize that your mind is this very powerful thing, but your body is actually stronger than you give it credit for. It really, really is. And if you can tell this, relax, breathe, the body naturally just follows and does that. So we have more control over our mind then we believe we do. And then the body just naturally will follow in its place. Yeah. It, it reminds me of something I probably would say to my son if we were having a similar conversation and he's 10 and I talked to him about muscle memory. Muscle memory is more than just learning how to ride your bike, right? Muscle memory is also just how you just articulated. It's holding that particular pose and telling yourself, the positive or the negative, you know, you're going to get a reaction. And it's not so much the more you do it is building just that physical strength, but it's also building that mental strength. If you can persevere and get yourself through that. So uh, again, that is something that I've learned through this process of yoga as well, you know, and I might miss it for a week or two, but you get back in on the mat and you level set. <laughs> it 
it's amazing what it can do. Do you have a couple of techniques maybe that people can start with if they're not attending a class or they have a hard time ha- having access to a class? What are some things that maybe they can start that mind-body connection? Absolutely. I would say the prana, the breath. I mean, breath is life, (laughs) you know, in in the book of Genesis, right? The very first book of the Bible, when God created man, what did he do? He breathed breath, right? Into the lungs and, and the man had breath, right? So breath, your prana, um, just sitting in an upright seated position, closing your eyes and breathing, consciously breathing in through the nose out through the nose, right? And really letting the breath fill up. Like imagine that your breath is a container and your inhale, you really want to fill it all the way up to the top of that container. And then the exhale, gently let it come all the way down. Another analogy I like to think of is blowing air into a balloon, right? So we blow that air all the way in into our maximum like lung capacity And then if we want to like let the air go, just slow and steady, let it seep out of the balloon. So it's the same way. And I say, I think once we can start to really become connected to our breath, right, just taking a deep breath in and taking a deep breath out, we realize again that it's one of those tools that helps inform our parasynthetic nervous system. I remember when I would have panic attacks, And I began a yoga practice. One of the things I would do immediately when I felt the panic attack coming on was breathe. Like for the first time, I had a newfound tool that allowed me to say, Marina, this is just stress and overwhelm that is not being properly managed. You are okay. You are safe. Breathe. And when I would just stop wherever I was and take three deep breaths in and deep breaths out, it was amazing how the panic would just, you know, I like to think of it as a wave, right? It was like at a peak and then like a wave, it would just wane from me consciously breathing. So I would say breath, begin with just some breathing exercises. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Now, you mentioned the control that you wanted to take back when you found that breath was a way that you could manage that, that sort of self-empowerment, I can control, I have some control here in this situation when I'm nervous, scared, or anxious. So empowerment is this recurring theme in your teachings, and you find it in, in lots of areas of your teaching, whether you're teaching us, you know, on the yoga mat, or you're coaching somebody, or you're doing some inquiry. So talk to us about how yoga can be a tool or yoga or meditation, whatever. I think there are elements in both can be a tool for empowering individuals, particularly for those who are dealing with health uncertainties. Sure. Absolutely. So power yoga, the style of yoga that I teach, I mean, I love the, the, just the name of it, power yoga. When you step foot onto a yoga mat, especially in this particular style of yoga, you realize that you really do have more power than you believe you do. You have the power to let an intrusive thought go. You have the power of non-comparison. You have the power to not look around the room and compare yourself to the right, to the left, the front, the back. So I would say that empowerment really an analogy for it is confidence. It's encouragement. And you realize through a yoga practice that you have these things more than you realize. I had a student um, when I had my yoga studio that had received a breast cancer diagnosis. And she would come to classes and just move at her pace obviously very much so modified in an adaptive practice, not, you know, nearly as all over, you know, headstands and handstands and all those things. And that's okay because that stuff doesn't make a yoga practice anyway, but she would come, you know, to the practice and just move and breathe and would always leave saying, I just needed to be here to remind myself that I'm not alone in this. Like even with this cancer, even with this chemotherapy, even with the long road ahead of me, just coming here 
makes me feel like I'm not alone. I have my yoga family. I have, you know, movement still in my body. I have my breath. That right there is the very definition of empowerment. The encouragement and the confidence and really the knowledge and awareness that we can, like we really can, no matter what we're going through in life, we can. Yeah. I love that. I personally, I had two surgeries in uh, the last year and a half and getting to the yoga studio. Well, mentally you're like, I just don't want to (laughs) go. I just want to be here and, you know, feel sorry for myself or just feel like I don't have the strength, whether mental or physical strength to do this. Or yeah, I maybe, you know, feel awkward or embarrassed because I have to do modifications or whatever. And um, one of the things that I could say that's always consistent in my yoga experience has been from my teachers has been, you've shown up that that in itself, you know, you are doing something for you, for your family, for the people that you care about by showing up because it's, it's only something that's going to encourage. That's right. And you still have to take care of yourself. Yeah. You still have to take care of yourself and pour into yourself and your well-being and your mental health, even while, you know, battling and, and moving through a space that's incredibly challenging. Yep, absolutely. Great suggestions in, in terms of, you know, how people can approach this and have a mindset going into this again, because we don't really know the experiences that people who are listening, right? I may have some yogis out there that are, you know, like totally embracing this and really feeling like I get it. That's why I show up. Thank you for reinforcing it. Or you have those that are, you know, a little hesitant because they don't know what to expect. And, and, and like I spoke to that earlier of yoga, not just being a bunch of stretches and back bends, right? It is so much more complex than that. And we've, in fact, we've not even talked about the quote unquote exercise. We are 20 minutes or so into our conversation and we've yet to talk about the physical benefits, right? So maybe this is a good time to talk through, yes, yoga does have some physical benefits and not just the mental empowerment elements that we really spoke to. So maybe you can give us a little bit of that and then and then we'll continue that conversation around empowerment. Yes strength building, right? You build strength, mind, body, and spirit on the mat. So strength, muscles. I mean, I could go on and on. Um, It's endless. It's truly, truly endless. Better sleep, better stress management, uh, you know, better management with anxiety. I have students over the years that have come to me and said, like, I'm no longer depressed. Or I was on, you know, medication for my depression and I've been able to wean myself off now because I'm doing a consistent yoga practice. So it really does just, it, it, I mean, it's, it's vast. The, the, the benefits are truly, truly vast and endless, but you will get stronger. You will. I have students that come to me and can't do a down dog. You know, they have a hard time just holding themselves up on hands and feet And through consistent practice, they're doing their down dog. Students who have a difficulty balancing on one leg and through repetition and consistency, now they're balancing. So again, you gain strength, muscle definition, and through a consistent longevity of a practice, you will notice very quickly just strength and balance and just being better for it overall, mind, body, spirit. Awesome. I would agree. One picture that comes to mind for me is that um, that test that you do when you're seated on the floor, kind of crisscross applesauce and try to get up without your hands. And I use that as an example, sort of mentally, like if you can do that challenge or if you're struggling to do that challenge, because I've seen, uh, you know, folks do this as part of their physical therapy to give themselves that goal to be able to just be able to pop up out of that position. And that is a sort of an indicator of your strength and flexibility, your, your core, which is super important. Yes. Flexibility. You took the word out of my mouth. I was thinking of it. (laughs) You definitely gain that through yoga. 
And, you know, I'd like to just touch upon a lot of people think they have to be flexible, Sarah, to start a yoga practice. And I always tell people you get flexible through the yoga practice. So it's not a prerequisite to starting a yoga practice, but rather a benefit of doing yoga is you're going to get flexible. It's just going to happen. I have people all the time say, I couldn't touch my toes. Now I can. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes is, yoga is not about touching your toes. It's about what you learn on the way down to touching your toes. I love that. Awesome. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about inquiry and empowerment and health challenges. So your work in inquiry has helped many folks navigate challenging emotions and situations. Sometimes you share one of the stories that you learned when we're in your class. And I love that because people need stories that will resonate with them, right? They hear other people's experiences and they know, like you said, I'm not alone. So tell us about inquiry, really how it specifically can support, you know, my audience, like through their hereditary health concerns or fears that may come with something like a cancer diagnosis. So inquiry really is all about just being introspective. You know, like I said, where you go, there you are. And so the inquiry work is just being in inquiry around something. So for instance, if I am holding a warrior two pose in a yoga class and all of a sudden I feel like I'm going to cry, that's an opportunity to be an inquiry around, hmm, where'd that emotion come from? What made me feel like I wanted to cry in Warrior Two today? And as we're in inquiry, the answers just, they just flow to us, right? We realize, huh, I wasn't really over that argument that I had with my spouse. I wasn't really huh, um, detached from that difficult conversation I had with a loved one the other night, right? And that's inquiry is just being in introspect, noticing what shows up for us, and then just being curious around, hmm, where'd that come from? You know, same could be said for anger. If I'm holding plank and I feel like I want to drop like F-bombs and, <laughs> you know, throw something at the teacher, it's like, where is that coming from, right? If I feel scared, if I feel, you know, like I, I just want to flee and run out of the studio room, again, where are these emotions coming from? And as we can get more in touch with what we're feeling, then there can become greater healing opportunity from that. Another favorite quote of mine, I have many, <laughs> is, you know, in order to feel, in order to heal, excuse me, in order to heal, you have to feel. And that the only way out is through. The only way to go out, right, of a door is to go through the door. We have to do the work of the feeling so that we can ultimately heal. My uh, student who had breast cancer would often share that the class would bring up a lot. Because again, you're facing yourself. You know, if you're holding a warrior too and you're looking at yourself in the mirror, or your gaze is, you know, over your right hand fingertips and you're just in the zone. It's like, it's easy for the stuff to come up. It's going to rise. It's going to rise and it's going to bubble over. And then you can say, okay, that emotion, that feeling came from the fact that I've got cancer. And I'm sad about that. Or, you know, the person going through whatever it may be empty nest syndrome, right? Or child getting ready to graduate from, you know, high school, go off to college or whatever, whatever it is, as you can identify it, then the healing can come from that. And that's essentially what inquiry is. Looking at yourself and having that deep introspect so that ultimately you can, you know, go forward more aware, more self-aware, 
to just make better, you know, choices for yourself and for your life, better choices to inform it. Yeah. In my, my mind, when I think of a pose like warrior two, um, the name in itself implies strength, right? And I don't know all of the Sanskrit names for all of the poses. Like when I hear them and I'm in the pose and I, I kind of get it, uh, but warrior resonates, always resonates with me. And it's, in fact, I, I love that you use that one as an example. It, rather than bringing up an emotion that is maybe one I don't necessarily want to feel, um, it actually brings up um, positive emotion and strength for me. Yes, absolutely. And that in and of itself can evoke an emotion, you know, for the practitioner that maybe doesn't feel like they're a warrior. They're going through something in their life where they don't feel strong. They don't feel like a warrior. That can evoke an emotion. Uh, for the person who has a hard time looking at themselves in a mirror, believing that they're strong, believing that they're enough, believing that they're powerful and great, that can evoke an emotion. You know, so it's it, that and it's just that's uh, the beauty of yoga is just what it brings to the surface. Oh, totally. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to go back to your history then just for a minute with your training in uh, Baptiste yoga. And I wonder, and maybe educate me a little bit on his model. Uh, I'm not even sure what the right word is, but really what his training encompasses, because inquiry is an element. Take us through that framework that, that Baron Baptiste has developed that has really millions of people are benefiting from today. Yes, absolutely. So there's like four core components. There's breath, there's meditation, the physical asana practice, and then inquiry. So those are like the four pieces that we work with in the practice. And then there's three principles, like three defining principles. And those three principles are be a yes, give up what you must, and come from ready now. So be a yes, give up what you must, and come from ready now. So those are the three themes. So in the Baptiste practice, you know, in a physical, like a class, a 60-minute, 75-minute, 90-minute class, we're working those four tools. We're working the, the breath, meditation. We're working with our physical body through the asanas and then our inquiry work. And then the three principles being be a yes, come from ready now, give up what you must. So that's what the methodology is all built around. So in his trainings, we do a lot of work <laughs> with those various pieces that I just mentioned. So it's a lot of breathing, a lot of meditation, a lot of practice, <laughs> and a lot of inquiry work. A lot, a lot, a lot of inquiry work, which gets you very uncomfortable, but that's the whole point. And then those three defining principles is really what a lot of the inquiry work is around. You know, how can I show up as a yes more? And not yes in terms of saying yes to everything, but saying yes to the things that I know I'm being called to in that matter. And then therefore having the strength to say no to the things that don't align with it. In order to give my yes, I have to give a no to something. Giving up what you must. What are the constraints? What are the areas in your life that just are not serving you? They're not serving your thoughts. They're not serving your life. They're not allowing you to live joyfully, abundantly. What, what are the, the areas? What are the habits? Sometimes it's people. Sometimes we have to, you know, look at that too. Um, and come from ready now. This idea that tomorrow is indeed uh, like not guaranteed, right? And that yesterday is past. So what we have is the now. And that's the very yoga practice is that it teaches us that we just have the moment that we're in, the pose that we're in, the breath that we're in. So it invites us to be present and to come from now. So right now I'm ready. I'm just ready. I'm ready for, you know, whatever comes. And he would tell us that in training too. <laughs> He'd be like, 
okay, come back after lunch and just come, come ready. And we'd be like, well, what does that mean? Are we going to practice? Are we going to meditate? Or... And we'd be like, okay. So we knew that Matt will bring your mat just in case he decides to throw in a practice and be ready. It's funny because, you know, I've been practicing for on and off for several years, more so in the last couple of years, as I've found how much I really love yoga and how much I need it in my life. But not really knowing this, uh, the principles that you just described. A lot of you that I've worked under, I specifically know I want to go through somebody who's had Baptiste training because I love the pillars. I love the structure. And it's funny, you can go into this and not know that that's what you're getting out of it. You actually, there is a process. There is logic to how the class is being taught. It's not just a head to toe stretching and flexibility and breathing. It's there's actually a very purposeful structure to each class that you attend. Would you encourage people, if they're interested in looking into this more, would you encourage specifically for Baptiste yoga instructors? Is there a way to find that if that's sort of the model you're looking for? But I'd love your thoughts. So I would say yoga is yoga is yoga. Whether it's Baptiste yoga, whether it's Hatha yoga, whether it's gentle yoga, whether it's yin yoga, whether it's slow vinyasa yoga. I mean, it's all yoga. It's all under the umbrella of yoga. So I would say it doesn't have to be Baptiste style. Just start. Just get to any yoga class and begin the journey. As long as you are breathing, you're present, you're, you're doing yoga. No matter what the name is or the umbrella that it's underneath it, you know, the lineage, I just so happen to have my training in the Baptiste style. I love the Baptiste style. It's the way that my body personally likes to move. Um, I love a challenge and the Baptiste practice is very athletic, certainly malleable and flexible though to anyone. That's the other thing I love about it is that you can still be in a Baptiste class and do your thing, you know, and make it your own practice, modify, adapt, add, subtract. When I had my studio, I had clients as old as 70 years old that would come to my classes and they would just make the practice what they needed to have it be. So I just say do yoga. I love it. Yes. Well, is there anything that we didn't talk about today that you would like to share with our listeners? Oh, goodness. I would say just be encouraged. Wherever, you know, your life finds you right now, whatever season you're walking through at present, be encouraged. I always tell my students, so long as you have breath in your lungs, a heart beating in your chest, there's hope. Why is there hope? Because you're living. You're living with the diagnosis, without the diagnosis, with the chance, with the risk, with the threat, with all the unknown that we live with. Day in and day out, you have breath, you have heartbeat. There's hope. So live that way. You know what I mean? That's what I mean when I say be encouraged, like really, truly be encouraged in each and every day because you're here. So God still has work to be done in and through you no matter what. And sometimes our lives and what we go through, our living testimony for someone else, right? My student who had breast cancer now can hold hands and rub shoulders and walk alongside another woman who battles breast cancer because she went through it. And so now her testimony, right, can be a blessing to someone else. So be encouraged. Be encouraged. Yeah. That's beautiful. I just really love how inspiring your energy and your words and your kindness and what you bring. I mean, speaking of God-given talents <laughs> and gifts, you really are a blessing. And I'm thankful for you. And I really appreciate you coming here to be on the show and really providing my listeners with encouragement and with hope and resources for them to really get through whatever they're facing right now. 
It's an honor. Thank you for having me. Really an honor. Thank you. I adore you too, Sarah. You are a beautiful, special light and your listeners are very blessed to have this podcast. So keep shining, sister. Keep shining. Thank you. Okay. So for our listeners who may be eager to connect or explore your services, if they're, uh, because I understand you are virtual, so you don't necessarily have to live in Middle Tennessee with us. Um, Give us a little bit more information. Absolutely. My website is lifewithmarina.com. My Instagram handle is at lifewithmarinayoga. And as you said, Sarah, I am virtual. I am national. (laughs) Um, So yes, you could uh, definitely link with me virtually. Um, Or if you're here in the Middle Tennessee area in person or virtual, Um, I do coaching, yoga classes, workshops. I mean, you name it, everything. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing your wisdom and insights with all of us today. For my listeners, just remember, you have the power to shape your health narrative positively. So stay informed, stay empowered, and remember you are not alone on this journey. So for more information and resources, visit my website at sarahkavanaugh.com. And until next time, keep embracing life with positivity and strength. Thank you for spending time with me on the Positive Gene Podcast. Your support means everything. If you found value in today's episode, I would be so grateful if you could take a moment to rate and review the podcast. It truly makes a difference. For an in-depth look and links to resources discussed today, check out the accompanying blog on my website, at sarahkavanaugh.com. Until next time, stay empowered and remember, you are not alone on this journey.